Well, this morning we're going to be all over the New Testament and some places in the Old. I want to start what I thought would be one sermon, but it's definitely got to be two now. Uh, The title is Two Destinations, Hell or Heaven. Before we jump back into Ephesians, it's it's one of the subjects I wanted to cover. Usually I take some of the summer and, and address individual topics, but God has his own plan. And uh, instead of continuing with Ephesians, I thought that we would uh, do individual sermons. So I talked about having faith in God. We looked at Psalm 46, trusting in Him. Uh, We looked at what to do in times of uncertainty. That was two sermons. We had a resurrection sermon, two sermons on prayer. And I wanted to address uh, what is hell and what is heaven before we jumped back into Ephesians. So you might wonder, Why would I cover hell on the first day we meet back after seven weeks? Well, what better time to preach the gospel? And to preach the gospel, people have to understand what they're being saved from. R.C. Sproul was once asked on the college campus when he was a young man. He was saved already, but an evangelist ran up to him and said, Are you saved? And he said, Saved from what? just to kind of make the guy stumble. And the guy did stumble a bit. He, he kind of stuttered. He didn't know how to answer it. He, he didn't know what he is actually saying. And so Sproul later in his life turned that into a little book. It was called Save From What? Question mark. And in that book he says, unless we know what we need to be saved from, we do not have an adequate understanding of the gospel and cannot truly share the Bible's message with others. And so he goes on to talk about this man who stuttered and and had trouble answering. He says, though this man had a zeal for salvation, he had little understanding of what salvation is. He was using Christian jargon, but sadly he had little understanding of what he was so zealously trying to communicate. So why this message? Well, you could say it's God's providence. I wanted to hit on it before we jump back into Ephesians, but also there's no better time than now to proclaim the gospel. People need to hear this truth. People need to hear what it is they're saved from. Christians need to be reminded, even as we take the Lord's Supper, what does it mean that he had his body given for us? What does it mean that he shed his blood for us? What does that accomplish for us? And unbelievers, of course, need to hear the truth. As we're going to see with most of these passages in the New Testament, when Jesus spoke about hell, he was doing so in evangelism. He was warning people. He was telling them what would happen if they didn't turn to Christ. If they didn't go to heaven, well, the only other option is hell. In fact, we see sort of the two paths many places in Jesus' ministry. He says, you're either with me or against me. There's no in-between. There's no sort of with Jesus, halfways with Christ. You're either with me or against me. He says, you're either trying to earn your own salvation Or the Bible teaches that you are saved by faith through the grace of God alone. There's only two types of religion, really, if you want to call it religion. There's only two types. True saving faith and works righteousness. And there's only two destinations that people can end up. There's no purgatory. There's no limbo. There's no place in between. There's only hell or heaven. So today we'll look at what is hell. And then next week we'll look at what is heaven. Well, we have to say the good news before the bad news. I even asked my wife, should, should I preach on hell or heaven this Sunday? Because this is our first Sunday back. She said, well, everybody wants to hear the bad news first. And I think that's true. And that's how Jesus often proclaimed it as well as the apostles. Well, we rarely hear sermons on hell. We rarely hear a sermon dedicated just to that subject. And we, we can sort of understand why. It's hard to preach on hell. It's uh, terrorizing in some ways to think too long about it. I think it was Sproul again who said it'll drive you insane if you think too long on what hell truly is. It's a serious topic, but I think most churches today don't want to preach on it because it's not popular. It's not well liked. It's one of those doctrines in the Bible that we can so easily pass over. Even as true born again Christians... We can just pass over it, especially if we're already saved, right? What do we have to worry about? What do we have to be concerned about? We need to talk more about it. We need to tell people more about it, and we need to preach on it more often. 
So I've got 11 points, 11 points. I think Andrew was kind enough to bring them up on the screen as I mentioned them. Uh, if you're watching online, we, we don't have uh, yet figured out how to put all the points on the slides and such, but hopefully we'll get there someday. I'll try to make these clear. Now, there's 11 things I think the scripture teaches on hell, 11 uh, descriptions we might say. And I want to work through these with you. We need to talk about it. We need to look at it. It's sort of like in your own life. You can't fix a problem until you recognize it is a problem and, and really consider what the problem is. Then you can start to look for a solution. Well, in the scripture, we need to look at what the problem is. The problem is we're sinners and we're all going to hell unless we're saved by Christ, unless we have faith in Christ. So first of all, we need to know that hell is a real place. It's a real place. Many people today think it's made up. They, they say that, of course, the Bible is not true. Others say, well, the Bible is true, but that's just very figurative, very descriptive. No, it's a real place. It's a place that the Old Testament prophets spoke of. Uh, I, I hold the view, as many scholars do, that Sheol in the Old Testament is a sort of a description of hell. It's not as specific as the new that Sheol was a place of darkness, a place where the dead went and suffered. The Old Testament prophets spoke of a fire that was to come. We'll look at a passage from Isaiah. Jesus had a lot to say about hell. Some people believe Jesus said more about hell than he did heaven. Now, I haven't gone through all the verses and counted them up because sometimes he doesn't mention the word hell and he just speaks of fire, he speaks of darkness, he speaks of punishment. But it's a real place. It's a place that he spoke of. The apostles spoke of. I did find one number. Over a hundred times in the Bible, this reference to hell, to eternal punishment is mentioned. It's a real place. In Revelation 20.10, it says that the devil who deceived them, who deceived people, was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's a real place. It was created for the devil and his angels. And of course, all those with him will be thrown in. All those who aren't with Christ will go there. It's a real place. We could even say it's a geographical place because it's described at least the, the final Gehenna, the final hell is described as a place somewhere on the earth, a lake of fire. It's real. It is a, a place that people should be concerned about going to. This is not something that we can say is fantasy, made up by the Greeks, made up by the Romans, made up by old ancient Jews who had nothing better to do than scare little kids. Now, sometimes in our culture, that's what it's turned into. In the Middle Ages, you know, the devil has his little pitchfork and his horns and his tail, and he's in hell and he's kind of, you know, poking people with a sizzling stick or pitchfork. And the Catholic Church came up with a way to sort of scare people on that. We're going to find out that's not a description of the real hell of the Bible. So number one, hell is a real place. Number two, hell is immediate upon the death of an unbeliever. It's immediate upon the death of an unbeliever. When an unbeliever dies, they go immediately to a place of torment, a place of punishment. Now, if we wanted to be real technical, real theological, we would say that's Hades. Or, or Sheol in the Old Testament, Hades in the New Testament. That's a present place of torment for the soul, that's important, for the soul of sinners who have not turned to Christ and repented of their sins. So when an unbeliever dies right now in this age, their soul, their body dies and goes into the ground. Their soul goes to this place called Hades. We saw that in Luke 16, didn't we? Go back to Luke 16 where we just read. And start up in uh, verse 22. Speaking of the, the poor man who died and the rich man, Lazarus. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. That's a figurative word for where the soul goes of a believer. They go to heaven to be with Christ, to be with God, to be with Abraham. The father of our faith, Abraham. So it's a figurative way that the Jews understood. So Jesus says, Abraham's bosom. It's not some secret place that's away from God, away from heaven. And then the rich man 
also died and was buried. Not much is said about him, but the next verse. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. So it's not as if he just goes into the ground and nothing happens until the resurrection. He's going to this place. We in English just call it hell. Everything for the unbeliever after death into eternity we call hell. In the original language, which our NASB is trying to bring out, it's called Hades. And it's still a place of torment for the soul. He saw Abraham far away. So we don't really know if, if he can actually see, if he can see people out of this place. In heaven, probably not, but at least for the parable that Jesus is telling, it works to tell it like this. And he cried out to Abraham, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. So this man's a Jew. He sees the father of his nation who's saved, who's in heaven. He asked for some little bit, a drip of water. Just dip your finger. It's so bad here. Just dip your finger in water. Give me one drop. For I'm in agony in this flame. In agony. The man doesn't even have his resurrected body yet. And his soul is in agony. His spirit is in agony. But Abraham said, child, remember that during your life, you received good things, likewise Lazarus, bad things. He's being comforted. So the soul rests in heaven until the resurrection, being comforted. But you're in agony. This place of hell uh, temporary hell, we might say, or, or Hades, the holding place before the resurrection, is a place of agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm fixed. So those who wish to come from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. There's no second chance. There's no, there's no going back. There's no bus to heaven, as that book by C.S. Lewis talks about. It's, it's a great illustration to think about it, but there's no actual bus that goes to heaven each day and you can get off if you want from hell it's a real place and it's immediate upon the death of an unbeliever they go to hades their soul is being tormented which means there's nothing like what's commonly called soul sleep soul sleep is taught by jehovah's witnesses by seventh day adventists and they teach that when you die your soul just goes to sleep it's not conscious anymore you could even say, they, they might say it disappears. And then it gets remade at the resurrection. So nothing happens to the unbeliever or the believer at death, they say. And then suddenly at the resurrection, things start happening again. This has been denied throughout the ages by the church. And it's denied here in scripture. We, we saw where Jesus spoke to the thief on the cross. And he said, what? Today you'll be with me in paradise. And in here, this man dies, this rich man, Lazarus. And where does he go? Sorry, Lazarus is the poor man. The rich man doesn't have a name. The rich man dies, and where does he go? Straight to Hades. Straight to Hades, immediately. There's no waiting time. No waiting time. So according to Jesus here, and what's recorded in the inerrant word of God, the soul continues on after death in a conscious state. It's not an unconscious state. It's conscious. The man knows what's happening. And even though it is a parable that Jesus told, it's based on reality. It's based on what really happens. That's why he told the story to begin with. But what happens after Hades? If Hades is the place where the soul is, but what happens at the resurrection? Well, at the resurrection, both believers and unbelievers get a body. Believers get a body to worship God and spend eternity with him. We'll look at that next week. But unbelievers also get a body. John 5.28 Jesus says, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. So they will be resurrected for a final judgment. There's already a type of judgment, suffering in Hades, but there's going to be a final, a worse judgment. A judgment for eternity. Jesus says, both the believer and the unbeliever will be resurrected. They will get a new body that will not die. And those who don't have Christ as their Savior will be resurrected with a body that never dies for the purpose of experiencing torment forever and ever. You see, a soul can't experience full punishment. It has to be a soul and body together. 
Just like a soul can experience all that God has in store for us and the new earth and eternal heaven. We have to get a body for that. Well, it's the same with an unbeliever, but the opposite. Some say, look, hell's not as bad as people think. It's just your soul being tortured, not physically feeling anything. It's just sort of panic or fear or depression forever and ever. No, Jesus says they will get a new body. We'll, we'll see later in Revelation 20, 14 and 15. Then, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. So there's a resurrection of both the believers and unbelievers. The unbelievers are in this place called Hades. And that whole place is thrown into the lake of fire. So now they have a body and soul combined together again to make a person, of course, thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is a term that Jesus uses called Gehenna. In English, when you see the word hell in your Bible, that is replacing the Greek word Gehenna. Hell is an English word. Sometimes universalists will try to trip you up and they'll say, you know, hell wasn't in the Bible originally. Well, a lot of these English words weren't in the Bible originally because English wasn't around then. It was written in Greek and it was written in Hebrew. But they'll try to trick you up on that. Gehenna is a place where the wicked will suffer. And, and historically, it was a place where the Jewish people sacrificed infants. They sacrificed their firstborn sons to false gods, to the god Molech, out, right outside of Jerusalem. And that was so evil and that was so sinful. God said he would judge them there when he came to the earth, he would judge them at Gehenna, the valley of Gehenna. And it became a place for judgment, a place of punishment. Now, there are stories later in the Middle Ages about trash burning there forever and ever, but there's no indication in Jesus' day they burned trash there. There was a place where the Jews understood that's where judgment would occur. So when you see the English word hell, that's replacing Gehenna. But remember, what we conceptualize as hell today is a lot of things. We'll look at those, but it includes Hades. So hell's immediate upon the death of an unbeliever. Number three, hell is necessary. It's absolutely necessary. It has to exist, first of all, because God said it would in Scripture. God's word is true. Every letter of it, every word of it, every sentence, every doctrine taught. doesn't matter how much we don't like it. doesn't matter how much we fight against it. If it's in the Bible, it is true. It will happen. But it also must happen because of who God is. Hell has to happen. It has to be a real place. People who don't trust in Christ as their Savior have to go there. Because of who God is, the attributes of God. He's perfect. He's holy. He cannot have His special presence in the same place as a sinner. Unless they've been cleansed by Christ. So, so God can't spend eternity with someone who hasn't been cleansed by the blood of Christ. He's holy. He's perfect. He's told us over and over in Scripture. It even says in, in Romans 1 that all creation speaks of the attributes of God. It tells us who God is. It doesn't tell us the gospel. You have to turn your Bible to, to see the gospel. You have to hear it from somebody else who's pulling it out of Scripture and telling you. But it at least speaks of a creator. A creator that we should give thanks to. A creator that we should worship. Of course, mankind didn't do that. They turned away. They turned to false gods. But God is perfect. He is holy. And he cannot look upon sin or sinners. He's also righteous. That speaks of his justice. God is righteous. It would not be just. It would not be right for God to let a sinner go with no punishment. Not only because it says that in the Bible, but that's not just. If someone comes and murders your whole family and then doesn't suffer at all. I don't know we live in a day and age where they're letting people out of jails all the time and writing Christians tickets for going to parking lot church services. But it's not just to let a murderer out of prison or never send him there to begin with. It's not just to send a rapist away from the courtroom scot-free. We would not even want that judge to be re-elected if he was an elected judge. That's not just. Well, how much more for God? How much more for God? 
we want God to be just. We want a God that is just. How many Christians are dying every day at the hands of evil governments and evil men? And the Bible says, don't worry, God will avenge. God will avenge the righteous. We want God to be just. That's, that's who he is. And also the attribute of the wrath of God. God has a wrath. It's spoken of in scripture. God is love. But God also has wrath. And that's, a, that's what we're saved from. If you're Christians, you're saved from the wrath of God. That's, that's what Christ paid for. He propitiated the wrath of God. He satisfied the wrath of God. And if it's not satisfied, then it's necessary there's a place where the unrighteous will be punished. The wicked will be punished. Number four, it's eternal separation. What is hell? It's eternal separation. Not, not just from loved ones, not just from this world, not just from your family, your spouse, but it's eternal separation from God. Those in hell are in a banishment and they're banished from the blessings of God. They're banished from the blessings of God's coming kingdom. There's no more common grace. Even an unbeliever in this life, the Bible says the rain falls on them, their crops grow, they get to go to work, they get to make money. They get to have the blessing of marriage and children. Many blessings even the unbeliever gets in this life. But upon death and eternity in hell, they're removed from that presence of God. They don't get the presence of God to bless any longer. And certainly they don't get the, the presence that believers will have with God forever and ever in eternity, which is the ultimate blessing and all the things that go along with that. They're denied access to the glories of the new earth. 2 Thessalonians 1.9, and, and you might want to write a lot of these down. You don't have time to go to all of them so that you can look at in detail later. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 says that Christ will judge those who deny the gospel. And it says, Paul writes, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and away from the glory of his power. They're away from God. They don't, they don't get to be with God in any kind of blessed way. In Revelation twenty two fifteen, John's just been writing about the vision that he's seen of the eternal city that's coming down, the new Jerusalem, the heaven upon earth. And he describes who will be in the city. And then he says, outside of the dogs. He's not talking about animals there. The dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. See, some of us can go down that list and they say, I'm not really a dog. I'm not a sorcerer. I'm not really that immoral. Certainly not a murderer, an idolater. Although we're all idolaters in heart until Christ changes our heart. But everyone who loves and practices lying. But don't think that God is nowhere present in hell. He's not there in a special way. He's not there probably even in a visible way. He's not there to bless, but he is there to punish. It's a total myth that Satan is punishing people in hell. That was invented by the medieval Roman Catholic Church. It's a total myth. Even the official Catholic Church would deny that. But all the movies, all the books, all the culture around Satan says that he's ruling over hell now. And that when, we go, or when a person goes there, they'll be tortured by him. Well, the Bible says hell was made, first of all, for Satan and his angels. The ones that fell with him. He's the first one going in. To the final hell, the Gehenna. There's, there's souls in Hades. They get resurrected. But right before they get thrown in to Gehenna, to the lake of fire, Satan goes in, his angels go in, the beast, the false prophet, all of those, the Antichrist goes in. And everyone who did not trust in Christ. Who's punishing then? Who's doing the punishment in hell? Well, the Bible says God is. God is present everywhere at all times. And since this is a real place, of course, God is there to punish. He's there to punish. And, and many of the rest of the points we're going to be looking at speak of what this punishment is going to be like. God's present there in a way that delivers 
the eternal punishment he promised. It's only getting heavier as we go down the list, isn't it? This is something we have to look at, though. Just like you have to go through an illness to get a, immune to the virus. Just like you have to, to suffer through trials and tribulations, even as a Christian, to learn and become the person that God is sanctifying you to be. We have to look at this hard truth here of hell. Number five, it's an eternal fiery furnace. Eternal, meaning everlasting forever. And it's a fiery furnace. A furnace, you know what? The furnace is a hot oven that just continues to bake. You think of the time uh, in Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar where he threw those three men into the furnace to try to kill them. And it was so hot that the guards fell back and died. That's the kind of ancient furnace that's in view here when Jesus speaks of hell as a fiery furnace. A place of intense heat and pain forever. It's the burning wrath of God, we could say. Now some say the fire is symbolic. It's figurative. We shouldn't get too worried about it. Well, fire is pretty bad if you get burned. It would be horrible to burn, be burned all over your body. If this is symbolic, we can't even imagine what the real thing is. I take it as real. I, I don't think it's a, a natural fire, though. I think it's some kind of supernatural fire. But the fire we know right now is as close as we can get to understand it. Jesus says in Matthew 5.22, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Whoever says to his brother, you're good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell, the fiery Gehenna. It's fiery because the body's being burned. The soul is experiencing the burning as well. It's a very deep sense of the wrath of God burning upon a person. It's intense heat. This is a fire that will last forever. Even in the Old Testament, they spoke of this. In Isaiah 66, 24, having just spoke of how the new heavens and the new earth are going to be upon the earth, the last verse in Isaiah, one of my, my favorite books of the Old Testament, the biggest prophet in the Old Testament, the last verse of Isaiah says, they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. Now again, some people look at this and say, well, it's just talking about the bodies and they die when Christ comes back. Yeah, but they're going to get resurrected bodies at the end of the millennial kingdom. And it says their fire will not be quenched. Isaiah is saying they, it never stops. And the worms continue to destroy the body and they're an abhorrence to all mankind. Jesus quotes that same verse from Isaiah in Mark 9, 48, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Even in Daniel in the Old Testament, it speaks of this eternal suffering, contempt, eternal judgment. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life. The believers, the followers of God, God's people. The ones that Daniel's writing to. These to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. It's going to be eternal. Hell's not a temporary place. Hell's not a place that people just go for some time. It's, it's not a purgatory where there's just a short time of suffering and then everybody gets to go to heaven. That's eternal. Matthew 13, verse 41. And also again in, in verse 50, Jesus says, The Son of Man will send forth His angels. They will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's so bad. It's so painful. It affects the soul in such a strong way that there's just this cry of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's the ultimate experience of pain and suffering. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say also to those on his left, so this is a sheep goat judgment, the Son of Man will say to those on His left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. 
but men and women go there because of their sin when it's not been forgiven by Christ. So it's prepared for the devil and his angels. They're going to be thrown in there. And also, Jesus says, depart from me, you accursed ones. The ones that said they were God's people but didn't help God's people when they were suffering and hungry and in prison. In Jude 7, he speaks of fallen angels. I think these are the fallen angels mentioned back in Genesis 6. We don't have time to go into that. But he speaks of fallen angels who do not keep their own domain, but sin. And it says they're undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So just like people who die and don't have Christ and go to Hades, there's a place right now where these angels are being held too, these fallen angels from Genesis 6. And they're suffering and they're being tormented in eternal fire. And they're all going in the same place together in the end. It's eternal though. There's no break from it. And in Revelation 14, 1, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. This is a verse that really ought to shake you. Especially if, if you're an unbeliever, maybe some kids are listening here. and Listen to this. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. It's not that they just suffer every day, but it's also they suffer every moment of every day, every second, every millisecond of every day, day and night, day and night. Those who worship the beast in his image, whoever receives the mark of his name. Well, the same goes for anyone today that doesn't trust in Christ. You don't have to live through the tribulation and receive the mark to end up in hell. But that is a description of it. Hell lasts into eternity. It coincides in many of these passages with the link that heaven will last. And how long does heaven last? How long does the eternal state, the heavenly state, the new earth last for eternity? Well, so does this place of eternal punishment we call hell. We just saw that in some of these verses, didn't we? These will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Matthew 25, 46. It's parallel, in other words. You have eternal punishment. You have eternal life. You take away eternal on this side, it's like doing basic math, right? If you subtract on this side, you subtract on that side. You can't do away with eternal punishment without doing away with eternal life. It's parallel. Many Christians want to change their view of hell. And this has gone on for hundreds of years now where they know it's in Scripture. They have to do something with it. So they say, It's only going to last for a certain time. It's annihilationism is what they call it, or what we call it. They don't always refer to it. It's the idea that, yes, there will be people in hell because the Bible says, but it won't last very long. And then they'll just sort of be obliterated. They won't be punished forever. And usually that's based on the idea that God would not make someone suffer forever and ever. I mean, he's a loving God. He would never do that, they say. And so this has got to be temporary. Maybe a few hundred years, maybe a thousand years. But it says it's eternal. Another view is called conditionalism. Conditionalism. These are becoming very popular. You need to know about them because you're probably going to run into someone that believes this. Conditionalism says, yeah, God's going to punish the wicked, but he's going to obliterate them. He only promises eternal life, eternity, to those who meet certain conditions. Trusting in Christ is a condition. Trust in Christ then you are immortal. You'll live forever. Don't trust in Christ. Well, you don't meet the conditions. You'll be destroyed. You'll be annihilated. So it's very similar to annihilationism, just putting another spin on it. But Jesus says, these will go away to eternal punishment. These to eternal life. They're parallel. The same in Daniel 12, 2 that we looked at. These will rise to eternal life. These will rise to eternal contempt. So where we've been, we've already said that it's a real place. It's immediate upon the death of an unbeliever. It's necessary because of who God is. It's an eternal separation from God. And it's eternal fiery furnace. We're about halfway there. Number six, it's an unquenchable fire. It's an unquenchable fire. This is different than a fiery furnace. A different description. It's the same place. But Jesus often describes it in various ways. He wants people to know. He's not scared of the truth. And he knows it. He created it. He is 
the Son of God, and he wants people to know. This is evangelism, to warn people of where they're going to go if they don't turn to Christ. And in Mark 9, 43, he says, If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than having two hands to go into hell. And here's how he describes hell. Into the unquenchable fire. Luke 3, 17. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. Well, he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. In ancient times, you went out, you cut the wheat. You, you brought all that back to your threshing floor, which was up on a hill. And that way, when the wind blew, you could throw it all up and the chaff would blow over here a little bit and hit the wall and the, the heavier grains of wheat would fall straight down. So you gather up the wheat, you could eat it, take it to market. But the chaff would build up over there, sort of like dust in your house builds up and you've got you to put it together. The best way to get rid of it is to burn it up. And it burns just like that. It's just straw. It's ready to be lit and consumed. And Jesus says, not only... Will people be burned like chaff, but it will be an unquenchable fire. It can never be put out. It will never be quenched. It will never consume the thing that it's burning. Back to Revelation 14. Those who don't follow Christ, of course, follow Satan. And it says that they will drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Revelation 14.10. The wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength. Wine back then was, was cut. It was mixed with water. You didn't get much alcohol in ancient wine. It took a lot to get drunk. But, but to drink all of it unmixed, it was very strong. And it's describing the wrath of God is very strong. And they will be tormented with fire and brimstone. And the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Every moment of every day. They suffer. It's unquenchable. It can't be put out. It can't be consumed. It just continues going and going and going. That's what unquenchable means. And the body's never burned up. And they never die. That's what it means to be in the wrath of God. Number seven, outer darkness. Outer darkness. Hell is a place of outer darkness. Even though there's fire burning, it's described as this eternal fire, fiery furnace unquenchable fire, it's also described as an outer darkness, pitch black darkness. You had the city or the camp, which has the most light. Then you went right outside of it a bit. You could still see, see with some light. But when you got very far out of the city or the camp, it would be complete darkness. Especially if the moon wasn't out, you couldn't see anything. And so Jesus describes hell as a place of complete darkness. In Matthew Three times he uses this phrase. Matthew 8, 11, I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So there's going to be people coming from all over the place, not just Jews. East and west, all over the world, there's going to be people who are in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers of the Jewish people. But the sons of the kingdom. Now he's not talking about the actual kingdom. He's saying, the Jews who thought because they were Jews, they would be sons of the kingdom. The Jews who thought, you know what? I checked that box. I was born into it. I was born a saved person. We have some people like that today. I was born into a Christian family. I went to church from the time I was a baby all the way till now. I have to be saved. That's how the Jews thought back then. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was married into a Jewish family. I am a son of Abraham. And Jesus says, sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's the same place that he's already described with the fire. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. They'll be cast out into the outer darkness. There'll be a great celebration when Christ returns. There'll be a great celebration into eternity. That's where the light will be. The light of Christ, the light of God. But the darkness will be where unbelievers suffer. Go over to Matthew 22. I want to look at this whole parable with you. Jesus told parables as a judgment. It was a warning, but it was also a judgment because he didn't reveal to people who weren't his disciples. He did not reveal the truth of these parables. They often had to ask him, the disciples did, we have to work to figure these parables out. But he, 
he preaches the gospel in these. Matthew 22, 1 through 14, the parable of the marriage feast. Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast. And they were unwilling to come. These are the Jews. They've been invited. Jesus came. There should be a big feast and a celebration. The Son of God, the Messiah, has come. They would not come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who've been invited, Behold, I prepared my dinner, my oxen. I mean, this is a huge feast. You do not eat meat every day. The oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered. Everything's ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention. They went their own way. One to his own farm, another to his business. The rest seized his slaves. They mistreated them and killed them. Speaking of the prophets and the Messiah. How easy is it to ignore hell? To ignore the doctrine of hell? To to not think about hell? I'll just go back to work. I got things to do. I don't have time to sit around and read the Bible. I don't have time to think about eternal punishment. This is the world. But the king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers, set their city on fire, pointing to Jerusalem being destroyed. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets. They gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. There's going to be people coming from all over to this thing. People who weren't even invited, weren't, weren't part of the people of God in the Old Testament, not born Jewish. Gentiles, in other words, are going to get into this thing through the blood of Christ. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guest, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. Now, this is a parable. He's not saying somebody accidentally got into heaven and then they figured it out. You know, God and, and, and Christ got together and figured out somebody snuck in. It's a parable to wake you up. When the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. He wasn't dressed accordingly. He didn't have the robes that we just sang about. The robes of Christ. He didn't have Christ's robe. The, the white robe described in Revelation. The one that's given to the believer because Christ has paid the sacrifice. He, did, he wasn't dressed properly. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The outer darkness. It's hard for us to imagine how there can be fire and outer darkness. Go to Matthew 25, 30. Another parable here, very similar. The parable... He tells the parable of ten virgins in the first part of Matthew 25. Then the parable of the talents. People think this is about how to manage your money. This is an investment scheme that Jesus gave. I used to hear that. You'll hear people taught that. Now this is about using what Christ has given you. Not just wealth, but all the resources and gifts he's given you. And the one who ends up not using anything turns out not to be the true Christian. Not to be a true believer. And it says in verse 30, The unfaithful slave, the one who was given something by Christ but did nothing with it, he's thrown out. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. What is outer darkness? Pitch black darkness where there's panic, there's fear. You can't see anything. And yet you're suffering. You don't want to be there. You don't want to go through that. Number eight, it's a number eight, conscious and spiritual awareness. Conscious and spiritual. Conscious, physical, sorry, and spiritual awareness. We've already talked about how Hades is a place of consciousness. It's not a soul sleep. The same thing in Gehenna. The same thing in eternal hell. It's a real resurrected body. In Revelation 19, 20, the beast was seized. And with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence. They they deceived all of these people upon the earth. And these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire. They're just thrown alive. Now, of course, they would have died the first death and then immediately been resurrected to suffer in the lake of fire forever. But it's conscious. It's physical and spiritual. 
think we've looked at that already with Luke 16. Remember Abraham said to the rich man, remember that during your life you received good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. So you can remember. A person in hell can remember their life upon the earth and understand how they didn't trust Christ and understand how they didn't glorify God. Number nine, hell is an eternal death. It's an eternal death. Now that seems contradictory, doesn't it? Death is one event. It's final. It happens. You can't reverse it. But the scriptures describe hell as an eternal death. Because you have eternal life in heaven. And the opposite of eternal life is eternal death. John 3.16, we all know, right? Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. He's, He's not saying that the believer will never die right now in this life. He's saying perish as in be destroyed, but will not suffer an eternal destruction in hell. But believers have eternal life. 2 Thessalonians 1.9, we looked at that about how unbelievers will be away from the presence of God. And it says they will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. So there it is. What sounds contradictory to us, eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord. Romans 6.23, a great passage to evangelize with for the wages of sin is death what kind of death well everyone dies because we're born from adam we're born as sinners so we have to all even believers go through the first death but he's not talking about the first death in romans 6 for the wages of sin is death but the opposite of that is the free gift of god that's eternal life in christ jesus our lord so the death there that that sin pays its wages Sin pays wages and it's an eternal death. It's an eternal destruction. Think of it as basically dying over and over because of the torment. Being destroyed over and over, but not actually dying. Revelation 21.8 But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So John calls it the second death. The first death is right now in this life. Then believers go on to live eternally, but unbelievers keep going through this thing called a second death. Number 10. Hell is effortless to enter. It's effortless. We're going to go a little longer since you guys haven't been here for seven weeks. We're going to go a little longer than normal. So we can finish this. But hell is effortless to enter. Jesus says in Luke 13, 24, Strive to enter through the narrow door. You got to strive to get in the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Doesn't mean work for it. Doesn't mean work for it. But you got to have faith. Jesus says you've got to take up your cross and follow me. That's not easy. Who wants to take up a cross and drag it through their life following Jesus doing what he said? Many will seek to enter. They're not, they're not going to be able. They're trying the wrong way. They're trying the wrong door. They're trying the door of their own works and their own righteousness. But the narrow door is the door of Christ. Let's go to Matthew 7.13. We'll look at these real quick. We have to. We're almost done with the list here. Matthew 7, 13. This is where he opens up this gate, door, road illustration. Matthew 7, 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. You see what it's saying there? More people will be in hell than heaven. The gate is wide that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Very few who find it compared. Now, now there'll be, I think, millions, maybe billions of people in heaven. But when you think about all the people who've ever been born since the beginning of time, since God created Adam and Eve, there's going to be more in hell. It's effortless to go there. You just keep on living your normal life. Think about it. You're born a sinner. You start to sin before you even can think really of what you're doing. You 
just keep on living a normal life. That can be a good Southern Christian culture life. Still end up in hell. Because that's not what it's about. It's about trusting in Christ. It's about having faith in him, repenting of your sins. You don't have to be a Hitler to go to hell. See, that's, that's I just saw an article that said that the, the new devil is, is Hitler. So if you want to really say somebody's evil, right? The president is like Hitler and this politician is like Hitler, they say. Because he's the ultimate in evil. You don't have to be Adolf Hitler and kill millions of Jews to go to hell. One sin. One sin. And some will even say that they're Christians. Go to Matthew 7, 21. They'll say that they're Christians and still not get in. Because it's not, it's not something where you just say, okay, I'm a Christian. I don't want to go to hell. It sounds bad. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father. See, it takes effort. Not that you're earning your way, but a true Christian will be doing good works for the glory of God. And they do the will of the Father who is in heaven. That person will enter the kingdom. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not grow up in Grace Bible Church? Did we not have our parents as Christians, God? Did we not give money to the church? What does he say? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He says, look, I know all things, but it's obvious in your life that you did not practice what you claim to be. You practice something else, lawlessness. He's quoting from the Old Testament. Lawlessness. It's effortless. You just go about your normal life, sinning, doing what you want. It could even be a good American life, but it doesn't take work to go to hell. It's not like you get this satanic tattoo and, or the mark of the beast even. Become a Satanist. Worship Buddha. Yeah, those things will send you to hell too, but it's the smallest sin. Well, that's not right, is it? People say, that's not right. Well, he's an infinite God and he's infinitely holy and he's infinitely perfect. So if you steal some bubble gum from the store, you think that's nothing. But you just stole. You just committed a sin. How do you pay that back to an infinite God? You just determine for the next 50 years, I'm going to suffer. 100 years. He's infinite. And he's infinitely holy and he's infinitely righteous. Of course, we all know we do more than just steal some bubble gum, right? Christ died for all sins. Even the smallest to the largest, no matter what, they're all sins enough to send you to hell. Well, the last point is really the conclusion. Do I have? Yeah, there it is. It must be avoided at all costs. Hell must be avoided. It must be avoided. Why does God put it in here? Why all these verses? Why does Jesus talk so much about it? Because he wants people to be warned. He wants people to avoid going there. He tells the Pharisees that they'll do anything to make a convert twice the son of hell as they are. Why does he tell the Pharisees that? They're stubborn. They're not going to listen, are they? Well, there was at least one saved, maybe more. He's evangelizing. You have to do all that you can to avoid going there. People have to hear the truth about hell so they can be warned. Here's how Jesus says, If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out. Pluck it out and throw it from you. It's better for you to lose one of your parts of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. He's saying get radical with your sin, with your repentance. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off, throw it from you. But it's better that you lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell, to Gehenna. And he says, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Get radical. You have to get radical. He's not literally saying cut off body parts. He's saying if, you're, if your mind leads you to sin, then get radical about repenting. Get radical about praying to God to change your mind, to change your heart. If your hands do things that are sinful, then get radical about that. If you're a believer, you better get radical about that in your sanctification. If you're an unbeliever, you better be convicted by Scripture 
and say, God, please help me repent. Help me turn from this. The only way to get out of hell is to be saved. What does it mean to be saved? That means to be saved from hell. What we just described. Saved from all of this. You don't have to do anything to end up in hell. Just be born. Go on about your life. You'll end up in hell. Turn to Christ though. You don't end up in hell. Turn to Christ. You end up in heaven. That's what we're going to look at next week. It's going to be a much more uplifting sermon. But you got to hear about the bad news. And there's, there's some kids in here who need to hear about this. Some of you were saved when you were a kid and you heard about this. Some teens need to hear this. Because God says this is where you're headed if you don't repent and trust in Christ. What does it mean to trust in Christ? To turn away from yourself, your sin, your works, and put everything on Christ. Everything that you are, everything that you own, everything that you want in life. It's all got to be about Christ. And he becomes your savior. You get his righteousness. He takes your sin. You're forgiven. There is no hell. There is no condemnation in Christ. There is nothing to fear. If you trust in Christ. So let's pray now and thank God. For sending his son to save us from hell. And let's pray that. All among us will. Trust in Christ. Lord, we do look to you and thank you for your word. You've revealed truth to us. Sometimes we don't want to hear all of this. It's, it's, it sounds negative. It sounds hard. It sounds fire, fire and brimstone type of preaching, but we know it's true. We acknowledge it's truth. We accept that it is real. And so, Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus Christ. As we celebrate in a few moments the death of Christ, we pray, Lord, that in our hearts as believers, we would be grateful that we know what we're saved from. We understand your righteousness and your wrath and your justice, your holiness. And we ask that for those here today who have not turned to Christ, who maybe they call themselves Christians, but they're really not, or maybe someone who wouldn't even call themselves that, that you would use this message, these verses, and the Holy Spirit's work on their heart to change them, to make them believe, to bring them to the point where they understand this will happen to them if they don't trust in Jesus. So we ask this in his name. Amen.